Mikhail Gorbachev is in North America tonight, but he's thinking a lot about this man, Boris Yeltsin, back home in Moscow. From the summit in Washington, NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Good evening from Washington, where the capital tonight is awash in rainy weather and high hopes for sunny skies by the time that Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev arrives here tomorrow evening. Tonight he's in Canada, his first stop on a six-day North American tour. And while he has a full agenda here, he has what appears to be a new challenge at home. Gorbachev's Canadian stop is designed to set the stage for his talks with President Bush beginning Thursday. When the Soviet leader met Canada's Prime Minister Brian Mulroney today. They discussed the new political alignment in Europe and Moscow's urgent need for more trade with the West. Gorbachev, of course, remains a popular, charismatic figure in the West, but his standing at home may be at its lowest point since he assumed power, mostly because the Soviet economy is a mess. And NBC's Bob Abernathy in Ottawa with Gorbachev tonight tells us the Soviet president now has even more to worry about. Bob? Gorbachev was upstaged as he traveled by the election in Moscow of his populist rival and critic Boris Yeltsin, now president of the Russian Federation, representing half of all the Soviet people. Even though Yeltsin won by just four votes after three hard-fought ballots, his supporters were euphoric. Yeltsin told them he would spare nothing to try to lead Russia to better times. Yeltsin had been attacked personally by Gorbachev, who accused him of wanting to go too far toward a market economy and of wanting too much Russian independence from central government control. But Soviet spokesmen today said Yeltsin's election might strengthen the economic reform movement and thereby help Gorbachev. Here in Ottawa, meeting Canada's leaders, Gorbachev did not congratulate Yeltsin. Rather, he said he's somewhat worried because Yeltsin's election was so close, such a confrontation. He said he hopes Yeltsin's talk of cooperation with Gorbachev is not insincere. If it is a political game, then we are in for difficult times. It won't be easy. Outside the Soviet embassy, the first of thousands of demonstrators expected here and in the United States to protest Gorbachev's opposition to independence for the Baltic republics. The prime ministers of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, worried about being sold out at the Gorbachev-Bush summit, Today said Gorbachev has no legal authority to represent them. In Moscow, where the consumer economy remains in crisis, Prime Minister Rishkov defended his government's plan to raise subsidized prices. The Supreme Soviet rejected overwhelmingly a proposal for a vote of no confidence. Meanwhile, in Armenia, the funeral today of one of the two Soviets killed in last weekend's clash between Armenians and Soviet troops. A mass funeral for most of the 25 Armenians killed is planned tomorrow. Gorbachev will be briefing his hosts here and President Bush in Washington on his many troubles at home. And he freely acknowledges they are many. Gorbachev seems philosophical. Speaking today of the election of Boris Yeltsin, Gorbachev observed, life is richer than any teacher. Huh? Thank you, Bob Abernathy, in Canada tonight, and a senior member of the Soviet delegation, one of the Kremlin's brightest young men, is Vitaly Churkin. He's the advisor to Foreign Minister Edward Shevardnadze, and Mr. Churkin will be with us all week long. Mr. Churkin, as you know, on these occasions in the past, the United States and the Soviet Union have talked primarily about arms control, reducing those big nuclear weapons. But this time, I assume, from the Soviet point of view, it will be equally important to reach some kind of a trade agreement and a new arrangement for politics in Europe. Is that true? That's true, and probably the uh, broad political aspects are going to be most important subjects of uh, the conversations between the two presidents. Uh, uh, the standing of our two countries in the changing world, changing Europe, as you pointed out correctly, and uh, uh, the way we're going about building our relationship from now on, from the uh, rather high plateau which we have already reached. Let's talk for just a moment about trade. You probably will get a trade agreement, but it will not be as good as the one that the president is prepared to give China. Does that surprise you? Uh, well, uh, uh, we, are not, we are prepared uh, uh, to have a summit without a trade agreement, though I think that uh, it would be very important to have one if the American side is prepared uh, uh, for it. Uh, I think that the reference to immigration is no longer really valid because there are no restrictions, in fact, to immigration from the Soviet Union. Over 200,000 people emigrated last year. 
uh, they are speaking about the law, and we also think that uh, it would be important for us to have that law, uh, but the Supreme Soviet is simply doing other things. So basically the reference to law is a technicality now. One of the president's senior advisors said today, it is inevitable that you'll have to talk about Lithuania, even though President Gorbachev has said he is not prepared to discuss that subject here. Don't you think it is inevitable? Given they, the they are certainly going to talk about it, but of course that does not change our attitude to it as being uh, our domestic uh, issue. But uh, we understand why uh, Americans are interested in this subject, and I'm sure that uh, President Gorbachev is going to reiterate our intention to settle that issue through dialogue with the Lithuanians. Are you nervous about Boris Yeltsin being at home while the president's here? Not at all. I, th I think that actually it might help Mr. Gorbachev to have uh, Yeltsin uh, chairman of the Supreme Soviet of the Russian Federation. They both uh, want the same thing. They want reform, they want market economy. Uh, some people in the Soviet Union, especially the lower income uh, se segment of uh, our society, are worried about that. Uh, and uh, if uh, Mr. Yeltsin's popu uh, populist uh, appeal uh, to them will help uh, the reforms go forward, it will be very helpful, I think. Vitaly Chorkin, thank you very much for being here. We'll see you all week long, right here. Thank you. Thank you very much. The way the State Department said today that an agreement to greatly expand Soviet American air travel will be signed at the summit meeting. Currently, only New York and Washington have air service to the Soviet Union. Now, Chicago, Miami, San Francisco, and Anchorage, Alaska will get it as well. In the Soviet Union, U.S.-based flights now limited to Moscow and Leningrad will be expanded to six other cities. A total of seven U.S. airlines will now fly to the Soviet Union. Also coming up here tonight on NBC Nightly News, the Supreme Court agrees to decide a major abortion question, federal money and abortion counseling. Also tonight, a Soviet dancer and an American theater technician show us how the world is changing for the U.S. and Moscow. As the Iron Curtain is lifted, there's a new common stage for the two cultures. Here in Washington, the U.S. Supreme Court agreed today to take on another volatile question of abortion rights. This case involves restrictions imposed on family planning agencies by the Reagan and Bush administrations. We have more tonight from NBC law correspondent Carl Stern. The court agreed to decide next term whether the government may bar the nation's 4,000 federally funded family planning clinics from telling poor women about their right to abortion. A suit was filed by this Planned Parenthood clinic in New York's South Bronx. We have women who come in who are in a pregnancy crisis. They have the right to all the information that's available to them. Other suits were filed in Boston and Denver, and courts have split on whether the ban is constitutional. So far, the clinics have successfully resisted what they call a gag rule. I'd have to stop after mentioning pregnancy, um, going to term, adoption, foster care, and it would gag me in the other area. What the regulations specifically tell the physician to say if a woman says, well, I'm interested in an abortion, the, it says that the doctor must reply, we cannot give you information about that. We can only send you for prenatal care. For a lie of birth. Correct. The clinics in low-income neighborhoods receive about $200 million a year in federal help. Anti-abortion groups want the payments stopped if tax money is going to be used for abortion counseling. You can look at it as picking on poor women only if you think it's a wonderful thing for poor women to abort their children. Um, you know, we would look at it in the sense that poor women keeping their children is a very good thing for poor women and for all women. And that there's nothing unfair about that. In the next few weeks, the court may decide another matter, whether teenagers have to tell their parents when they want an abortion. But as in today's case, the court does not seem to be questioning whether a right to abortion exists, only how broad or narrow it may be. Carl Stern, NBC News, at the Supreme Court. Then there is this problem faced by many mothers and mothers-to-be in this country. The federal government now is cutting back on food allotments for poor women and children because it's running out of money. NBC's Robert Hager has that story tonight. In Fort Worth, Texas, low-income mother Susanna Eldridge will get less cereal and juice than in the past. Near Los Angeles, Christina Rosco will receive only half as much orange juice as she gets now. The federal food program for low-income women, infants, and children, called the WIC program, is in trouble. Normally, four and a half million low-income women who are pregnant or have new babies get monthly vouchers for some basic foods of high nutritional value. Important to combat the very high rate of infant mortality in the U.S. But while Congress allowed for an increase of 4.5% in food prices this year, in reality the increase has been from 8% to in some cases 
The cost of orange juice, milk, and cereals all up more than expected. The chairman of the House Committee on Hunger, Tony Hall, calls this a crisis. Estimates the WIC program could be $67 million short this year and could be forced to cut off benefits to 52,000 of the eligible women and infants. Betsy Clark, who directs WIC in Oregon, objects. I think as a country we have enough wealth to be able to supply um, a few basic foods for women, infants, and children. Some states are already cutting out cheese for all recipients. Cheese is an important source of calcium. Some other states are cutting back on orange juice, a source of vitamin C, or peanut butter, a source of protein. In Fort Worth, victim of the cuts, so, Susanna Eldridge you know, is worried. You know, if they were to cut, I'd have to sacrifice a lot of things that I get, you know, and then get things that are definitely needed so that my kids could eat. But cuts now seem inevitable in at least half the 50 states. Robert Hager, NBC News, Washington. Another special astronomy mission, already four years behind schedule, was delayed again this evening. The shuttle Columbia was being filled with fuel for the mission when technicians noticed a leak. It could take several days to fix it. The mission involves using a space observatory to examine ultraviolet light and x-rays given off by distant galaxies. Officials at the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis announced changes today designed to stop hazing and sexual harassment. One female midshipman resigned last month after complaining that male classmates were not punished for handcuffing her to a urinal and laughing at her. Under the new rules, any upperclassman found guilty of abusing a classmate, male or female, can be expelled. On Wall Street today, a big rebound. The Dow Industrial soared to another record high, the seventh in the past 11 trading days. Now that the Cold War has ended, there's a fascinating paper trail into the world of communist espionage. Many of those trails lead to East Germany and revelations about what American secrets were known to that country. NBC's Mike Betcher has more on all of this intrigue tonight. With the fall of communism and the freedom of movement between East and West, there has been a flood of information about spies, past and present. Secret American intelligence documents in the possession of the East German intelligence agency known as the Stasi were recently smuggled to the West. They show how successfully the communist spy network had compromised American secrets. Among the documents, a proposed American plan of attack on the Soviet command structure in the event of war. The operation, titled Canopy Wing, also describes how the communications of advancing Warsaw Pact forces could be disrupted by exploding a nuclear bomb in the upper atmosphere. The fact that these documents fall into enemy hands could seriously interfere with the effectiveness of the operation. The Stasi also had documents detailing U.S. electronic intelligence capabilities and plans, along with the location of secret American listening posts. East German penetration of American security agencies extended directly inside the European headquarters of all U.S. forces in Europe. The Stasi files contain the minutes of a quarterly meeting of American intelligence officials inside the headquarters. An editor for the West German magazine Quick, which first obtained the smuggled documents, said American officials asked for copies. We passed this over uh, via some contacts in the U.S. Embassy in Bonn, and we know that this material is right now in the hands of uh, U.S. intelligence specialists. However, the files may tell them something they already knew. Last year, Warren Officer James Hall, an intelligence specialist, pleaded guilty to selling U.S. secrets to East Germany. It is likely this material was sold by him. West German authorities have been stunned by new revelations of the scope of Stasi operations. And this week, West Germany's chief spy prosecutor warned that improved relations between the two superpowers will not end the threat of espionage. Mike Betcher, NBC News, Frankfurt. This was homecoming day for one of the former American hostages, Frank Reed. Reed was given a parade in Malden, Massachusetts. It was an official welcome back to the suburb just north of Boston. Since his release, Reed said that he has gained almost 20 pounds. And he asked that the people of Malden not forget the hostages still being held in the Middle East. 
In another part of the world, South Africa's President de Klerk said today that he has now postponed a trip to the United States in a meeting with President Bush. That meeting had reportedly been scheduled just before Bush's meeting with Nelson Mandela next month, and members of Congress signaled that de Klerk's reception would be warmer if he waited until after Mandela came here. Mandela today was recovering from minor surgery performed at a hospital just outside of Johannesburg. The clinic would not say what the operation involved, only that it was nothing serious. Today was John F. Kennedy's birthday. How old do you think he would have been? 73. In Boston today, an eight-foot statue of the late president was unveiled at the State House. The statue was hailed by Senator Edward Kennedy as a remarkable symbol of what he said his brother stood for, America on the move. Also at the ceremony were JFK's daughter Caroline and his widow Jacqueline Onassis. In New York tonight, with his commentary and some thoughts about what we're about to witness here in Washington and across the country, John Chancellor. John? Tom? In all the years that the United States has been meeting the Soviet Union at summit conferences, there has never been a Russian leader in as much trouble as Mikhail Gorbachev is today. Even during the years when only America had nuclear weapons, Joseph Stalin still had the biggest army in the world. Nikita Khrushchev blustered and Leonid Brezhnev fell asleep, but both represented a powerful and cohesive Soviet Union. Gorbachev's Soviet Union is seriously ill, suffering from a profound case of cynicism. This is made worse by the fact that everyone who lives there knows that things are going to get much, much worse before they get any better. So why should we deal with Gorbachev? Because there are 287 million people in his country, because the Soviet Union has thousands of nuclear weapons, because its armed forces are still powerful and still in Eastern Europe. And Gorbachev himself still has all the reins of power, more power than anyone in Russia since Stalin. It would be a mistake to treat him only as the leader of a bankrupt system, as we might deal with the head man in Albania. The Soviet Union is too big and too strong militarily for that to be a useful strategy. And the Bush administration, to its credit, understands this. George Bush can sometimes be so careful that he gives prudence a bad name. But in this case, he's playing the game the way it should be played. The Soviet Union may be on the ropes, but it cannot be ignored. Which is commentary for this evening, Tom. Thank you, John. By the way, we have one more sign of the astonishing changes in what used to be known as the Communist Empire. Bulgaria was always one of the darkest, most rigid parts of that empire, and now the Wall Street Journal is reporting that Club Med has made a deal with Bulgaria to open a resort on the Black Sea at what was once a fancy spa for top Bulgarian communists. But then once they opened a McDonald's in Red Square, what was left? Tonight, something a little different. We asked two of our correspondents, Bob Kerr and Rick Davis, to show us what may be the new world of culture if old animosities between Washington and Moscow can be eliminated. And they tell their stories with the help of an American stage designer and a Soviet dancer. Soviet ballet dancer Alexander Lunyev. His moves are bold, and so is what he's done. Lunyev has toured the world three times, but always as a member of the Kirov Ballet. This month, he was on his own at Boston Ballet's production of Swan Lake. He came alone on a tourist visa and even signed a contract to appear with Boston Ballet next season. Unimaginable before Gorbachev. I decided to not completely change, but to try a new life for a season. To live and work like an American. And Americans are trying to live and work like Russians. This is the stage of the Moscow Art Theater just last week. Not a place you'd expect to find Yale drama students, but Scott Robertson has wanted to come here for a long time. It's been my dream since I was 12 years old to come to Moscow. As Robertson looks forward to helping the Soviets produce a Chekhov play at Yale this fall... And Soviet dancer Lunyev realizes new freedom to travel and work in Boston. It is, he says, time for dreams. If a company wants a certain dancer or wants to put on a certain production, they should be able to invite dancers from all countries. In the past, such greats as Nureyev, 
Makarova. And Barishnikov had to defect in order to dance in this country. They lost their Soviet citizenship. Boston Ballet artistic director Bruce Marx says it's much different now. I can go to Russia and say to an artist, oh, I'm very interested in your work. Come and dance with us for three months, six months, a year. Uh, come and live in Boston. I could never do that before. And Scott Robertson could never have been involved in a collaboration with this Soviet theater group before. I'm struck by the fact that theater is like an international language. We have ten bottles. And that bond is reinforced after the theater. This is another kind of international relations once officially frowned upon. And though he enjoys his time with American friends in Boston, Alexander Lunyev wants to maintain ties with his homeland and dance again with the Kirov. Still, he is realistic. A lot depends on Gorbachev. Just as the door suddenly swung open and it became possible to come and go freely, on any given day it could just as easily slam shut. For now, though, it's clear, Lunyev thinks Mikhail Gorbachev is someone he can talk to. Oh, it's Mikhail. No, it's me. Oh, okay. Sure. Good. Maybe. I don't know. Next week, maybe. Okay, bye. That's Nightly News for this Tuesday night from Washington. I'm Tom Brokaw, and tomorrow, President Gorbachev, the real person, arrives for what his advisors are calling the most important summit yet. And we'll cover it from the beginning to end. I'll see you tomorrow night.